Greetings. Welcome to CyberFocus, your source for international business information. I'm your host, Ron Craven, and our guest today is Jeremy Williams. Jeremy was the Defense, Naval, Military, and Air Attaché in the British embassies of Abu Dhabi and Bahrain during both the Iran, Iraq War and the Gulf War. His military and diplomatic career spans 35 years. During this time, he spent over 12 years living throughout the Gulf region. His services include tours of duty in the USA, UK, Germany, and Singapore. He remains in contact with many government and commercial organizations throughout the Gulf and the wider Arab world. Germany is a member of the Saudi British Society, the Bahrainian Society, the anglo Omani Society. He was a member of the Middle East Association, the Arab British Chamber of Commerce, and the British Business Group in Dubai and Northern Emirates. He is a contributor to The Times, BBC, NBC, and Sky News on Arab and Islamic matters. His company, Handshake Limited, is based in England. And he travels the world to conduct business seminars focusing on the cross-cultural aspects of life and work for Westerners in countries in the Gulf. He also offers online training as well as onboarding contributions to companies with Gulf interests. He has counseled over 500 companies and organizations at the board and other levels. Jeremy is also the author of the book, Don't They Know It's Friday? A Cross-Cultural Guide for Business and Life in the Gulf. Today, we'll discuss Jeremy's extensive experience from his time spent in the Gulf, how he shares that knowledge with people today. We'll also talk about business and life in the Gulf region and the value of cross-cultural introductions to the area. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for asking me. All right. Uh, so, obviously, I have to start off with, uh, you know, how did a British Army officer find himself involved with the Arabs? When it first started in 1969, the British had uh, foreign and defense policy for much of the Gulf region. We never colonized it. And I was part of the residue of uh, the Trucial States. I was in the Armored Car Squadron, B Squadron, 3rd Royal Tank Regiment, and we were based in Sharjah. So my first experience of Arabs was living amongst British soldiers and British Royal Air Force and so on in Sharjah. And I never met any Arabs at all. And by chance, two years later, they asked me to go out to help start the Dubai Defense Force. And I had to go to Arabic school and I had to go then to uh, Dubai, to, to a piece of desert where we created a camp. And I was invited to train Bedouin, I mean camel drivers, goat herdsmen in armored car world. And that was, that was uh, <laughs> shall we say, a bit of a stress in Arabic, teaching a goat herder how to do 76 millimeter gunnery. That was fun. But they actually, they taught me something. They taught me, uh, why do you put a restriction on the range that the gunner inside the vehicle is allowed to manage? I say, well, that's because, because well, then I would think, well, why do we put a restriction? The, the Bedouin would say, well, we can see forever here in this desert. So why do we need to put some sort of European restriction on it. So that was the first instance where I realized that these people, uh, they may be camel herders, but they, they had brains and they had, they had instincts and so on. And so I learned a lot from them. Maybe I taught them something as well, but it was fun and it was stressful and I do, do it all again. <laughs> and you mentioned uh, you had to go to Arabic school back then. Yeah. <laughs> what, would, what did that entail? Well, it was 12 weeks of panic. Uh, and my wife, who was a teacher, was horrified at the way I was taught Arabic. Uh, we were taught in a manner of, uh, now tell them to go set faster. And I didn't know the word for fast, because we hadn't been given it in a vocabulary. And the instructors who were Arabs said, there's going to be a bunch of stuff you're not going to understand. So you know the word for fast. So say, not fast, for slow. And when I re <laughs> relayed this to my wife, who's a sort of perfectionist linguistically, she was horrified. And the message was really, you're not out there to learn Arabic, Arabic, Arabic for perfection. You're out there to teach people how to shoot a gun or to do this, that, and the other. They taught me Arabic. But I learned Arabic from the Arabs. Uh, and the first weeks and months were just awful because I wanted to say something. I want to explain how to open the breach and so on. Now, I didn't have that kind of skill. so. Uh, it wasn't so much the heat and the, and the, and the, and the circumstances of living out there, the problem. it was language, not having the skills to be able to explain something that needed a bit of noise. I caught on after 
a million years, it felt like, because they, they, would, they would use a word to me and I'd learn from them. So they, they taught me Arabic, I think. That it, it's a military Arabic I have. What was it that created the concept of handshake and the need and opportunity for cross-cultural training? Well, after Dubai, I was f uh, with the Haras uh, al-Watani, the National Guard of Saudi Arabia for three years, living in Riyadh. And then after that, I was defense attaché in Abu Dhabi and later in the uh, Bahrain, a couple of Gulf Wars, three ambassadors. And one thing I noticed that Western people, mainly British, would come to the embassy and ask for advice, business people, on how to approach the Arab customer. Uh, do I shake his hand? I'm a woman. Where is the Middle East? Please explain to me what GCC means. You know, the Arabs are all the same, aren't they? And I would think, oh my God, do you understand nothing of the region? Well, I didn't say that to these visiting business people, but it occurred to me after persistent displays of ignorance. I don't mean ignorant stupid, I mean ignorant just don't know. And I mean, I'd been immersed in Arabia or the Gulf countries. And I thought there's a job here, there's an opportunity to go to large organizations and present to an audience how it's going to be for them uh, when they go to Dubai or they go to Abu Dhabi or they go to Kuwait or they go to Riyadh or go to Jeddah. Uh, how it's going to be, how, the, how they should behave in company uh, with, with the Arab customer. Because I found that uh, if you show, let me start again, they know us. The Gulf Arabs know us. They come to London. They come to New York. They come. They know the West. The Gulf Arabs, the rich, particularly rich travel ones, they know us. They've been to MIT. They've been to Oxford. They know the West, and we don't know them. So when they find a Westerner who seems to understand a little bit of Islam, a little bit of their culture, their history, and doesn't come out and thinking the British way is best or the American way is best, but it sort of blends in with their outlook that they bond you quicker, and that may be commercially rather advantageous. They choose your company over that person's company who's just come out and said, do it my way. Because mm, you've expressed a little bit of interest in, and in, you've done that research, you've done, you haven't showed up and just say, this is me, this is what I'm doing. It, well, the, the thing is, you've got to be patient. If, you're not, if you haven't got patience, Ryan, don't go near the Gulf Arabs. They're going to drive you mad, and I love them all dearly, but you are going to be driven crazy. I mean, they invite you to come out now, Please bring out your uh, uh, proposal again. We'd like to you have some people see it. And you get out there, you've not gone to your daughter's wedding, and you get out there, and he's gone to Morocco. Now, how's that going to treat you? So you, you need to have a company that is funded and has the brain part. I say, well, no, fly to Morocco then. You went to Abu Dhabi, he's not there, go to Morocco. What's the problem? I mean, for many Westerners, having cancelled the daughter's wedding <laughs> to go out at the special request of a rich Gulf Arab, and you find he's gone to Morocco, which is a true story, by the way, uh, will drive you crazy. So in terms of HR and management, you need to select people who can roll with the punches. I mean, there is a story I'll offer you. Uh, Sheikh Ahmed of Kuwait, a, a charming uh, and very clever man, speaks fluent Italian. Uh, he would say to me, Jeremy, where are you? And I'd say, I'm in Wiltshire, which is southwest England. Come now, we'll dine. So I'd, I'd say to my wife, uh, and she'd say, Sheikh Ahmed? I said, yeah. She said, see you tomorrow, because she knew the game. So I'd get in the train up to Paddington Station, it's the main station in London, as you may know, get in the cab, and he, I'd say to the cab driver, take me to Ishbila. And the phone would ring, and it was Ahmed. He said, no, not Ishbila, Marouche. So I say to the driver, not Marouche. Uh, and it happened a third time. He changed the venue in three phone calls in the cab, whilst I was in the cab. And the driver said, what the hell is going on here? How can you manage a life that is like that? And I said, I'm just going to have dinner. We're just going to go to another restaurant. And he said, yes, but how do you mentally, how do you? I said, if you can't do that, then don't go near the Gulf Arabs. Patience. Patience. Um, you mentioned kind of identifying that need, um, and you've providing, been providing these services for over 30 years. Um, you know, has that trend grown, changed, evolved for those kind of services? It's increased, I'm afraid to say. 
I mean, the fact that we can communicate with all manner of clever devices now has brought cultures closer together. And uh, I know, I mean, most of the Gulf Arabs I know, especially the ladies who are fantastic, and they are in sight now. They've always been present, the Gulf ladies, but now they are at running companies and so on. But the Western awareness, unlike the Arab awareness of the West, the, I'm talking about the Gulf Arabs in particular, I mean, don't lump Arabs is perhaps the, the very first teaching point. They're all different, you know, even between cities, they can be different. So hmm, I'm afraid to say the requirement for Jeremy's uh, teaching and his book, Don't They Know It's Friday, which is about to be in its fourth edition. Uh, I mean, the, the, I, I gave a lecture in Dubai, in a place called Nadashiba, and I handed out an, a couple of A4 sheets. And an Arab said, uh, this is good stuff, Jeremy. Why don't you turn it into a book? Because you, Western person, can tell other Western people what we find awkward and difficult about you. But we Arabs can't say we find you rude. But you, Jeremy, thank you very much. Now write the book. And so the book, Don't They Know It's Friday? And the title of which is The Cry of My Wife from the Next Door Room. When pre-cell pre days, pre-mobile days, when I was defense attaché in Abu Dhabi, the Ministry of Defense would phone me at home on a Friday. And they'd say, uh, Jeremy, why, why are you not in the office? I said, because it's Friday. And they'd say, well, what's that got to do with it? I said, don't you even understand that Sunday here is Friday. The day off is Friday, not Sun. Oh, I didn't know that. So don't they know it's Friday? The title of the book is the fundamental cross-cultural. I mean, I can't think of a more basic thing, never mind all the cleverness about whether you cross your legs or do shake hands and so on. Don't they know it's Friday is the cry of my wife to the Ministry of Defence in London when they would phone me on a Friday saying, why aren't you in the embassy? Yeah, and you, you mentioned a, a few of the points, but uh, you know, what are some of the most obvious uh, you know, mistakes people make when they first encounter Arabs? Not to say, assalamu alaikum. Or rather, put it another way, if you do say assalamu alaikum, they will relax. Here comes a slightly different Westerner who seems to have done a little bit of rehearsal into our history, our religion, and so on and so forth. And uh, perhaps you would know uh, how to shake a hand. Uh, I mean, w we can shake hands now, and I would say assalamu alaikum. And you would probably say alaikum assalam back to me. They relax quickly, I suppose is the right word. Because the vast majority of Westerns they meet have no idea at all about history and religion, as, just, as, I, as, I, as I said earlier. So the ability to say, assalamu alaikum, the peace upon you, and receive the reply, alaikum assalam, they, they sort of, ah, at last, I seem to have met somebody who understands something about us. And then if you talk about a little bit of the history uh, of, of, the, of the region and the nation at all, I'm mean, not saying you do it artificially, but by your demeanor, and your responses, and you're a patient person. Oh, and you've got something that they want to buy. I mean, that's pretty international requirement. The, the salesperson had better have something that they want. You know, you've got to buy this. Well, I don't, don't want one. Uh, well, what would you like, of course, is, is, the, is the way to do it. But uh, I've seen a million business people go out and <laughs> say, buy my product, with have, not having done any kind of investigation as to the need and the requirement. I mean, that's not. Gulf Arab stuff. This is international business. You, know. you, you want to sell something that they want, that they're interested in. Why bother your time otherwise? Absolutely. Um, what would you say were the easiest things as a business person to get right when dealing with Arab customers and wrong? Oh, I love to watch a Gulf Arab negotiating with a, a, an innocent Westerner. I mean, I would sit over there and I'd, I'd know the Arab concern, and he'd wink at me a little bit. And he'd then say to the poor Westerner, who's about to be completely savaged by the theater of negotiation. You see, Arabs, negotiations in the blood. I mean, the fetus is capable of bargaining in, in, in Arab land. They love bargaining. And it's not actually a question of um, getting the price down. It's usually, or can be, adding something as part of the, the project, I can probably fund two of your students to come to this university here. 
as part of the deal. So the bargaining doesn't have to be just money. It can be a little advantage. Because what the Arab's friend is going to say, well, what did you get off him? Never mind the price. You know, the price was X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what else did you get? Well, I got two places at uh, Indiana. Well, that's impressive. Well done. So the kudos of winning something in bargaining is what they're, they don't, the, the money bit isn't actually the, it's whether you won something. And they love it. And they, and they, and they are theatrical about it. And, and uh, I, I <laughs> I'm afraid I do it in Britain a bit, uh, which rather fools uh, some of the people in Harrods. Very nice. Um, so the kind of the final question that we've got for you today, uh, Jeremy, is you know, what's your view on the situation in the Gulf and you know, Iran at the moment? Well, how many weeks have we got to answer that question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I I Iran, take three circles. Sure. And they're all interlocking, and they don't talk, or they overlap, and so on. So you've got the uh, the, the national, the the the, uh, the uh, you've got the government, you've got the theocracy, and you've got the guard, and they all interplay with one another, and they don't coordinate, and so on. So Iran is uh, uh, deliciously confusing anyway. Never mind the horrors and so on. I mean, go to California and meet a lot of Iranians there. If you really want to understand Iran, go to California and talk to the diaspora there, because you Americans have got an awful lot of uh, Iranians there. But I mean, the, the, the message I offer you is, never mind the complexity and the horrors that are going on at the moment. The word is nuclear. Iran with a nuclear capability, dear God, that's got to be stopped. Never mind the integration and, and, and the uh, unfairness of the, of the government. and all that. Nuclear-tipped Iran, that gets me up at night terrified because they're going to blow Israel away, or they're going to do something awful for God. And that, that's the bit. So Iran, nuclear, that should have us all panicking. I mean, f focus on the fact that Iran cannot be nuclear-tipped, and everything that we non-Iranians do should work towards the, f the first priority, which is no nuclear Iran. That's, that's the summary uh, as, I, as, I, as I offer you. Well, thank you for the insight, Jeremy. And I appreciate you coming to speak with us Thank today. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. That's all for this edition of Cyber Focus. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any comments or suggestions for future topics, please let us know at cyber at indiana.edu.